go to the Lord again once in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you today for the time that we have to be here. We thank you today for the moment we have to be in your presence. Lord, we, we thank you to know that, that you have a word for us. You will open our hearts and minds and spirits. You will minister to us and give us what we need right now in this hour. May we not be distracted. May we not be overwhelmed. May we not miss what it is that you would have to say to us in this moment. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. All God's people say, Amen. I'm excited about today. I'm excited about the weeks to come. Uh, we are going to be spending uh, one more week improperly talking about uh, some of uh, some of the emotions that are stifling our ability uh, to move forward. Last week we talked about the emotion of worry, uh, and today we're going to tackle yet another emotion. And so. Uh, Lord willing, next week we're going to be starting a new series. Um, definitely within, I would feel, the next two weeks. Uh, you would have banners up, but it didn't really turn, they didn't really turn out the way they should. I'll tell you what it, it's going to be. It, the, the, the sermon series is going to be called It Is Written. And uh, maybe at first look you might think, oh, it's, it's going to be about the Word of God. It's all about the Word of God. We are going to be, we're going to be pushing in for about four weeks, roughly, on temptation. We're going to be talking about temptation. And see, uh, I think sometimes it's, it's interesting when I say that word, some of you immediately go to one place. I don't know what that place is. You know what that place is. But the thing is, the Bible has a lot to say about temptation. And for some reason, I, I was open to go in a different direction. God said, no, this is what we're going to do. And so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to be in some really... We're going to be in some interesting parts of the Bible. We're going to be in Corinth, Corinthians for a little bit. Then we're going to be in the book of James for a little bit. And we're going to be a couple other places. And so we're going to explore the gospel. We're going to explore the written word. And we're going to talk about what temptation is and what it isn't. We're going to talk about how to, how to be ahead of it. And how that temptation doesn't lead to sin. Um, we're going to talk about the consequences of temptation. Um, because there are consequences. One of the big things I would say, don't miss week one if you can. Week one, I, we are going to lay the foundation, and it, it, it's, we're going to we're going to go to school, and we're going to define the difference between temptation and sin because there is a major difference. Uh, and um, we're going to lay the foundation, and then we're going to move. And so, if you're going to be on vacation, jump on the site, make sure you catch up because I don't want you to miss uh, where we're going for the next couple weeks. There are all kinds of temptations. We know that. Uh, the temptation, even what we talked about last week, to worry. The temptation to anger. The temptation. There's a lot of temptations. And so, we'll talk about that. But today, we're going to talk about an emotion that every one of us are probably oh too familiar with. And that is regret. We're going to talk about regret for just a few moments. It's interesting, this, this idea of regret. I looked it up uh, in the dictionary. Regret is this. It's a feeling of sorrow, disappointment, Distress or remorse about something that one wishes could be different or one wishes they could change. I'm going to say that just in case you missed it. This is regret. A feeling of sorrow, disappointment, distress, or remorse about something that one wishes they could change or something they wish could be different. Let me ask you this. Understanding the definition, does anybody have any regrets? I mean, it's like the dumbest question ever. Because we know the answer. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is absolutely. There's a thousand things that we would do differently if we could. There's, there's, oh, there's a lot of things that we could do differently if we could. That we would change if we could. And here's the thing. When, when, we, when we have regret, it brings feelings of sorrow. It brings feeling of stress. It brings feeling of remorse. And it takes us to places we don't want to be. Do you know I did my brilliant self this week? I thought it'd be a good idea to sit down and uh, think about it. Do I have any regret? That's like the dumbest thing I could have done. And then I, I, I sat down and I began to write like the things. I was like, what would I do differently? And then I, I wrote, and then I wrote, and then I turned another page, and then I'm like, why am I still going? And as I'm sitting there writing these things down, do you know what happened? I immediately felt stressed out. As, I, as I'm writing these things down, I immediately felt deflated. I felt defeated. I, I felt devalued. I began to question my purpose. 
I begin to question my skills, my abilities, my, my sanity. Are you, do you have any brain cells, son? I mean, am I the only one? Come on now, that ever questions these kinds of things. And this is what regret does to us. This is, I mean, it was as if, as if to prove the point that I sat there and did this and immediately everything was defeated. Everything was lost and it destroyed my day. It destroyed that moment. I, and it really affirmed the sermon. I, I, I decided to go into my office and pull out some books um, of reference from some of the various classes and clinics on mental health. And I pulled out a book and I, I, I wanted to find out the clinical side of regret. I wanted to read this to you. I went old school, by the way. Look at that. Too. Like, how can you read that? So regret is this. You go into the mental health state and look what the professionals say. Regret is this. It is a negative, a cognitive, or emotional state that involves blaming oneself for a bad outcome, for a, a feeling uh, of, of having a loss or sorrow of what might have been. Wishing one could undo a previous choice, unsee an un, uh, a, a previous experience, often, listen, this is the part that was key, often paralyzing a person's ability to grow and move forward in life. That's exactly what we've been talking about for the last eight weeks. The idea of moving forward. The idea of keeping going when everything in you wants to stop, when everything in you wants to quit, you're surrounded by darkness, you're surrounded by fog, you're confused, you're tired of losing, you're tired of things not working out, and you want to quit. You want to give up. You don't see a way forward. Regret is the, is the greatest state of that. Regret, it paralyzes your ability to move forward because you live in the remorse, you live in the pain, you live in the sorrow, you live in the mistake. And so this is what we're talking about this morning. This is what we're going to talk about for just a few minutes. I hope you're ready to join me. If the person next to you falls asleep, just hit them in Jesus' name. They want you to. All right, are you ready to jump in with me? All right, I believe three of you are. The rest of you will join us later. To look at regret, we're, we're going to look at the poster child of regret. Uh, we're going to talk about David. Because he's the poster child of the biblical state of regret. I mean, that, that's when, when, you, when you open up the Word of God and you start looking at people that would have regret. David, King David, was that guy. Now, hopefully you know a lot about King David. Hopefully all I'm going to do is remind you of some things you know today. I'm going to tell you a story that I hope that you know today. Because we, we did a sermon series on him. We called it Flawed Hero. Uh, we've talked about David uh, a lot. If you don't know who David is, I'll give you a quick version of David. David was the man. I mean, he was a he was a hometown hero. He was the great giant killer. You remember that whole thing with Goliath? He was a poet. Everybody likes poets. He was a musician. Um, he was a, a phenomenal leader. He, he led a nation to the greatest power that it would ever be. It was the greatest power on earth at one time. He was awesome. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this about David, that he was a man after God's own heart. Could you imagine that being documented about you? All of these great things about him, right? Yet, he was a peeping Tom. He committed adultery. He, he, uh, he had someone killed. He was a horrible dad. I would say he would do a lot of things differently. And so what we're going to do is we're going to catch up at the end of David's life. We're going to catch up with him at the end of his life and we're going to see what's going on. We're going to be in 2 Samuel, uh, the 23rd chapter, because it's here he begins to pray. He begins to pray, and I want you to notice the words he uses. 2 Samuel 23 in your Bibles, 2 Samuel 23 on the screen behind me. Is not my house right with God? Has he not made with me an everlasting covenant arranged and secured in every part? Will he not bring to petition my salvation and grant me my every desire? David starts off this prayer. This is him. He's talking to God. He starts off this prayer with a question, listen, that every one of us should ask ourselves right now. You, you should ask yourself this question. If, if I'm being honest, it's like super highlighted in my Bibles because this is a question that I need to remind myself all the time. We should ask ourselves on a weekly basis. That first question, is not my house right with God? As followers of Jesus Christ, every one of us sitting in this room, we should ask this question on a regular basis. Is not my house right with God? In other words, you could, 
Some of you are like, that sounds too biblical. Well, then change it. Change it to this. Am I where I need to be with Him right now? Is my relationship with Him where it should be? Am I walking with Him the way I should be? Am I connected with Him? Am I representing Him well? Am I being the, the, the biblical husband or biblical wife He wants me to be? Am I being the biblical mother or father He wants me to be? Am I being the, the co-worker that God wants me to be? Am I being the, the good neighbor that God wants me to be? Am I where I need to be with Him? And here's the big thing. Right now. Is not my house right with God? A lot of us know our house wasn't right with them, meaning our past. We know that. Some of us have a, had a, a, a rough past. We had a season of life where we lived the Vita Loca, whatever, you know, you, you just were wild. And, you know, you, you, some of you, you know, it brings back a good smile, but you're like, good Lord, I'm surprised the building didn't burn down when I walked in. We had a past. That's not the question. It's not about was your house right with God in 1975 or 1995 and 2005. That's not the question. And that's where too many of us get hung up. It's not about was my house right with God. No, it is right now in this moment. Am I right with God right now? Is my house where it needs to be? Back in Samuel uh, 11 and 12, we find David's big mistakes. It was the whole thing with Bathsheba. It was the whole thing with with, you know, killing Uriah, all that stuff. Uh, then we fast forward roughly 10 to 15 years later. And 10 to 15 years later, we're in chapter 13. Second Samuel, let's begin reading in verses 1 and 2. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister, yes, you read that right, that he made himself ill, for she was a virgin. It seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Okay, it's important that we know something and notice something here. You are not watching Jerry Springer, yes, you're reading the Bible. And things are not looking good, is it? No? Anybody? I thought you'd be paying attention to this story. I mean, if you can avoid wanting your sister, that's a good thing, right? And in this situation, it's not a good thing. This is not a good thing at all. And this is not a course of love. This is a course of lust. The scriptures say that he wanted to do something to her. And some of us, when we read that, uh, we think that that seems unnecessary. I remember being in the Bible study, study in 2 Samuel, and this lady saying, well, I don't understand why that had to be in there. Why is that important? Well, it's very important because what the Bible is showing us is the consequences of David's actions. We're see, see, that's the thing we, we, we need to recognize, that even though we're forgiven, even though we have grace, there are consequences for our actions. And there are repercussions of the things that we say and do. I, I mean, I, come on now, you can't act like a dum-dum to your spouse and be like, why are you being weird to me this afternoon? Did you not remember how you talked to me earlier? Right? Well, you're just supposed to ignore that. That wasn't me. Oh, it wasn't? An alien took over your body, right? There's consequences for those kinds of things. You, you just, there, there's consequences, and this is the first consequence of David hooking up with Bathsheba. In chapter 12, we see that Nathan, he, he, he rebukes David for what he's done, what he did with Bathsheba. Watch what he says in, in, in verse 11. This is what the Lord says. Out of your household, I am going to bring trouble upon you. This, 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 listen, this is the Bible affirming what we're talking about. That, that when you do these kinds of things, that, that there are consequences. We are beautifully under the grace of God, His umbrella. But there are consequences for our actions, and, and, and there are repercussions of our actions. And here we see that the, 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 the man of the hour speaks to David and says, Listen, God is going to bring trouble into your home. And when you see a situation with Amnon and Tamar and all this going on, this is trouble, guys. We know that. This is trouble. Anytime there's lust where there shouldn't be lust, anytime that there's activity that there shouldn't be activity, there's going to be trouble. And so you, you keep reading. Look what he says. Bef before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. I mean, this is this is some this is some serious stuff. David's family and his children. Listen, I want you to see this. David's family and his children are paying for the mistakes he made. Why is this important? 
he's seeing his sins replayed right in front of his face. And it's important because I, I, I would ask this question before we move any forward, have, have, any further. Have you ever, have you ever seen this happen? Have you ever seen the sins? Maybe, have you ever, let's, let's put it this way. That, that's going to be too harsh. We're not going to like that. We're going to put it a little differently. Have you ever seen the same mistakes you've made being played out with your children? I mean, you know, they, they're, they're doing the same thing you did. They're, you see how they act in traffic? I see Preston get mad when we pull through a red light, and I'm like, <laughs> semi-proud but semi-upset, right? <laughs> and the body. It's the, that's just, those are, the, those are the minor things right there that turn into the big ones. I want you to hear me on this. Those are the small things that turn into the large things. And it's, it's interesting, this is what's happening with David. His kids are making the same mistakes that he made. They're giving way to lust, they're giving way to the, the flesh, they're giving way to anger, they're giving way to malice. They're, they're going into the practices that they, they need to avoid. And so word gets back to David that this is going down. Watch what he says in verse 21. And when King David heard all of this, the, the, the feelings that were happening with Amnon and Tamar, look what the Bible says. He was furious. Period. That's it. What the Bible tells us right here is that David does nothing. And this is important because we're talking about regret. He does nothing. He, he, he maybe punches the wall, you know, kicks a random farm animal that's walking through the courtyard, does whatever he does, goes for a wall because he's angry, and does nothing with the real situation. He doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't rebuke Amnon, uh, which would be the right thing to do. Call him in and be like, you can't do this. That is your sister. Ain't happening. What do I need to do to shake you out of this? He doesn't go to Tamar and, and comfort her and love on her and, and give words to her that she needs to hear. He, he didn't speak to Absalom and be like, dude, we got to get this straight. We, gotta, we, gotta, we, we can't do anything crazy. We got we to pull this in. Do you know why David doesn't do anything? Because of his regret. He doesn't do anything because of his past. David, because of his moral mistakes. David, because of his past sins, you know, the whole Bathsheba thing and having Uriah killed and the whole peeping thing from the rooftops that he was so good at, all the lust issues and, and all that stuff that he had going on, David felt unworthy. He felt unworthy to speak to his children. How am I going to go talk to you about lust when I'm full of it? How am I going to talk to you about avoiding doing something you shouldn't do when I've done that very thing? This is, this is what David has I just felt like maybe this has happened to you. Maybe this is where you are now. Because of your past, because of your regrets, because of the things that you would do anything to change that you would have done differently. Because of your past sins, you feel disqualified to speak to a friend you see fall apart, making mistakes, but they know who you are. So you wouldn't dare say anything. They're going to throw it in your face. You see your kids making these mistakes and you're like, can't say anything to them because they know me. They see how I talk. They see how I walk. They witness who I am on a regular. So they're just going to they're they're going to laugh. I can't I can't talk to my coworker about Jesus. I can't tell them. I can't step in and try to help them. They're they're about to go down the wrong path because they saw me three years ago. They know what I I went through. You know I I, I had a guy. Not too long ago, he, he came to me very emotional. He had just started coming to the church. And God really did something in his life. And he had made the decision. He was taking back his marriage. He was taking back his home. And he was legit. He was on it. And he was like, I'm going to do devotions with my wife. I'm going to do devotions with my kids. We are changing things up. I'm going all out. And he, he came in so broken because he, he tried. And they laughed at him. I mean, they, they were like, yeah, okay, Dad. Yeah, because you know the Bible so well. You've been to church, what, twice? You know, oh, th this is going to be the new husband? Yeah, you? You're so loving? And, and you know, it, it took the wind right out of the sails. Yeah, you're right. I can't do any of this. They know who I am. They see how I walk. They see how I talk. They see how I've been. 
And it, it just took all of his desire and passion, his ability to move forward. It was crushed by the regrets, by the remorse, by the pain and mistakes that he had made. It, it, it's interesting here with David. Every time I read this, I think, David, you are exactly who need to be talking to your kids. I think about it. Your kids are in a sexual frenzy. There's, there's lust, there's anger, there's guilt, there's regret. There's a bunch of emotions of, oh, I can't believe I've done this. I can't believe I made this mistake. There's a bunch of the you know, lust, regret, anger, guilt. Hmm, David, that sounds a little familiar, dude. Lust, anger, regret, remorse, hostility. Sounds a lot like you, dude. This was David's moment to step in and be like, guys, I know what you're going through. I've been there. And let me tell you about the consequences. Let me tell you about how you're going to lose sleep. Let me tell you about how you're going to feel. Don't do this. And you could have coached them. And I think for many of us, we fail to recognize that the things that, that we've gone through, they are a blessing to be passed on to someone else. I told people all the time that the statement, and people they, they like they think like wave it off like it's elementary. I think it's a powerful one. Your test is your testimony. The things that you've gone through, that is your your storms are your story. What you've gone through is the story you tell. When you see somebody falling apart, when you see their marriage broken, when you see their kids going off, when you this is when you step in and be like, I was there too. I know it's. I know it makes you vulnerable. I know it's like, yo, oh, I'm airing out my dirty laundry. They can do anything with it, but listen, God sent you through it for a reason, and so He gives you discernment on how to use it, and when to use it, and who to use it with, and it can help you keep pushing forward. You see, the, here's the thing: the devil wants you to be passive. He wants you to feel disqualified. He wants you full of regret. He loves that because he knows if he's got you doing that. And that he's got you by the bondage of regret. And you are enchained. You're enchained to your past and to your failures and by your mistakes. And see, some of you right now, you're already starting to feel good about it. You're already starting to think, you know what, Jason, I'm going to use it this week. I'm going to tell some about There's some people I, I know that I put, can I tell you something? By tonight, the devil is going to have you disqualified again. And we got to beat that. We're going we're gonna to get there. I think, I think we can get there. And this is how he does this. He, he paralyzes our ability to He's going to go deep. He's going to be like, oh, I remember six and a half years ago where you were. Let me go ahead and plant this in there. You see, time, time, time is not on your side. That might be a news life, but do you know that? Some of you are like, oh, I look good. I'm not talking about physically. Yes, some of you are like fine wine. You're looking great. And you're emotionally getting better and you're getting stronger. No, 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 no. Listen, time is not on your side when we're talking about emotions. And we're talking about regret. David allows time to move on. Two years, actually. Two years later, Absalom is still angry over what had happened. And he kills his brother. And he kills him. Here we go again. David, it's happening once again, dude. And so David loses a son to death. Another who had to flee for his life because he killed his brother, and has a daughter who's scared to live. He's been broken by a situation that should have never happened. And look what the Bible says. Chapter 13, verse 39. The spirit of the king, look at this. The spirit of the king, David, look at this, it longed to go after his son. It longed to go after Absalom. For he had now, he had consoled himself over the death of, of Amnon. And, and here's the problem with regret. And if some of you are writing this stuff down, this would be a good note put in there. Here's the problem of regret. Regret leaves things unsaid. How many times have you seen people be like, man, I would do anything to have one more conversation. I would do anything to be able to just pour this out and tell you something. I waited. I waited. And I waited. And that's what's happening. With, with David, David longed to speak with his boys. To tell them so many things. And for one, it was too late. He was dead, and the other one, he just couldn't bring himself to do it. Watch what happens. Verses 23 through 24. Absalom brought back uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, Absalom was brought back to Jerusalem, but the king said he must go to his own house 
I must not see his face. So Absalom went to his house and did not see the face of the king. Now, why is this important? <laughs> if I'm a son, and if my dad said this to me, I don't, I don't know how I would have handled it. I can tell you one thing, I would have taken a message very clearly. My dad doesn't want to see me. And you know what I would have thought? My dad doesn't want to see me because I killed his other son. That's what I would have thought. It's because of what I've done. I want to, don't, don't miss this. I think too many times our minds shut down and be like, I can't do this, I can't do that. That person doesn't want to see me. That person doesn't want to talk to me. Because of what I've done, because of the mistakes I've made, because of the choices I've made. And we just assume that this is what it is. And that's what's happening with Absalom. He's assuming that his dad doesn't want to see him. But the truth is, David wants to see him. David is longing. The Bible says he's longing to see his son. He's losing sleep over not seeing his son. But he didn't want to see his son because he couldn't face the fact that this was his fault. That's what he felt. David felt guilt. He felt remorse. He felt all of these emotions because of what he had done. And David's not mad at him. He's mad at himself. And the icing on the cake, too, to make things even worse, was everybody, they all loved Absalom. I mean, the town, he, Absalom was the man. Absalom rolls into town. Look at 2 Samuel 14, verse 25. In all of Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his feet, there was not a blemish on him. And so he has everyone's approval except his dad's. He has everyone's approval except for his father's. The Bible says that Absalom, he was fine. That's what the Bible just told you in case you missed it. Archaeologists recently found a picture of him. I want to show it with you. Um, <laughs> and and uh, that, I'll give you another one in case you want to. So that's better. So archaeologists recently found that uh, this is what Absalom was. That's not Absalom. Have no clue. <laughs> Perfect from head to toe. That's pretty much that guy, I guess. You're welcome. Anyways, just make, I want to make sure you're awake. Thanks. The Bible says that he was, there was no one more handsome than him in all of the nation. He was perfect from head to toe. This was the guy walking around the streets and a couple of years later, Absalom gives David some grandkids. He gives him some grandkids, and I don't think he gets to spend any time with them. Do you know what Absalom names one of the daughters? Tamar. Out of, uh, you know, respect and love for her sister. Could you imagine what that did to him? Hearing about his granddaughter, named after the daughter, that he could have stepped in and, and changed things. I believe every time he heard that name, his heart sunk. Guilt, shame, and remorse. Defeat. Right back to those feelings. Uh, it's interesting. How many of you know relationships? Relationships that will never be the same because of regret. I mean, we all have them, right? We all have relationships like this. They will never be the same because of choices that we made or they made. They can't be undone. They can't be unseen. They can't be unexperienced. And the truth is, these words or these moments, they hurt. I guarantee you this is a true statement that you would probably agree with. The greatest, have you ever noticed this? I'll put it this way. In case you don't believe this. Have you ever noticed that the greatest joy and the greatest pain comes from relationships? It's just the way it is. Some of you are like, I don't know, I have a boat. Well, that's another sermon. <laughs> the greatest joy and the greatest pain, they come from relationships. That's a true statement. And do you know why that is? Because it's the gospel. That's the gospel message. That's why the greatest joy and the greatest pain come from relationships. That is the gospel. The gospel message is a relationship with God. That's what we were designed for. We were designed to have a relationship with our Creator. Just like as children, when we were born, we were designed to have a relationship with our family, with our parents. 
We, we long for that relationship. Kids want your attention. Sometimes they're needy. Some of you get that. You know why they're needy? Because they long for that time with you. And what's interesting is that is the exact same thing with God. You see, this is some of us grew up in church, and we grew up wrong. We, we really did. We, we went to church, and we thought that we'd go to church, and we had a relationship because we don't want to go to hell. We didn't want to go to hell. And so because we don't want to go to hell, we, we, need, to, we need to love God, we need to know God, that's what it's all about. No, 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 no. That's not what it's all about. Not at all. That's not even the gospel message. The gospel message is that we have a loving God who loves us enough to give His Son for a relationship with the Father. And so therefore, through this relationship, we worship Him. That's what it's about. That's why we come here. We come here to worship Him. We come here to grow in our connection and relationship with Him, to give time with Him. That's, what, that's why we come here. You're giving him time. It's like a date night with God. I mean, I, that's how I've always looked at it. I'm spending time with him. If I'm not spending time with him, I'm going to neglect my relationship. How, when you neglect your relationships, how does that turn out for you? Usually not so good, right? Well, it's the same way. We have a, a real... I'm going to stop. i got to read one scripture and then move on. 2 Corinthians 5.18. All of this is from God. Talk about this relationship. He reconciled us to himself through Christ, who's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting, look at this, the trespasses, the sins against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. What does that mean? What that means is we were designed for relationships, and when they go sour, something, I'm going to put it this way, something in us and almost everything in us wants to fix it. Some of us are a little different than that, but God's given us a message of reconciliation. So when relationships get out of whack, most of us try to fix them. That some, of, some of you have been trying to reconcile a relationship. You've been trying to reconcile this relationship, that relationship, and the other relationship. And it's not working. It's not working. And some of you are sitting there saying, Jason, it's not going to work. If that is you, then I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the ones who are sitting here right now, and you know good and well that you don't have a peace about the unreconciled relationship. That you've still got work to do. And if this is you, keep moving. The Bible says go the extra mile. Go the extra mile. Keep walking. But I'm tired. I don't like them. Keep walking. I don't want to talk to them. They won't even talk to me. Keep talking. Keep walking. That's what it means to go the extra mile. This is what God is saying to you. You know, the number one question I get asked all the time in counseling is when do I know it's time to quit? When do I know it's a time to walk away? When do I know it's time to, it's okay to be done? And I, I tell people all the time, <laughs> that is between you and God. Matthew 10, read it, talks about dusting off the sandals and being done. Only you know when it's time. Only you know when you've gone the extra mile and then the next mile and then the next mile. And when it's time that you say, okay, this relationship, it's, it's in the hands of the Lord. I'm moving on. Absalom longed for reconciliation with his father. He was desperate for it. And he was so desperate that he goes over to David's assistant's house. This guy by the name of Joab. And he burns up his fields. He's like, he's like verse 31 and 32, read it sometime. He goes and he burns up the fields of his assistant's house. He's like, I need to talk to my dad. I've emailed you, I've texted you, I've called you, and you ain't responded. So I'm just going to set your whole house on fire. I mean, you got to get their attention some way. You know any crazy people? Don't worry. Either. That's what he does. And so Joab is he's ticked. He burned his fields up. And he goes into David and he's like, your son burned up my fields because he wants to talk to you. You better do something about this. You better do something quick. And so... Verse 33, he says, Joab went to the king and told him, the king summed up, the king, the, the, the king summed Absalom. He said, okay, I'm going to do something. He calls his son together. Look at this. He comes and he bows down. Uh, this is Absalom in front of David. His face before the king, and, he, and, he, and the king kissed Absalom. Now, I want you to see this. And I think some of you are just like, Phew. because you're like, oh, okay. We just saw reconciliation. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. You think it is because you just read that, but it's not. Because in chapter 15, you find out that it wasn't reconciliation. It was actually all empty. I, here, here, in case you're wondering, have you ever faked reconciliation? 
Yes, you have. You know you have. Don't even act like it. We'll go back to that same thing. They said something dumb to you that morning and afternoon. They said, you need to get over it. You forgive me? And you're like, I forgive you. And they're going to pay for it, aren't they? You faked it. And they give you a kiss and it's the weakest thing ever. You're like, and you're just evil. Because you're blind. It's called fake reconciliation. We're really good at it. Coworker is like, I'm sorry I did that to you yesterday. You're like, yeah, I accept. Just wait. I'm going to make you coffee tomorrow with a laxative. You know, it's like, I don't know. I don't know what you do. I know what I do. But, you know, so like, why didn't you bring me coffee today? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm just being serious. No, but you've got this fake reconciliation. It, it gets really ugly. But you read throughout chapter 15. It gets uh, so ugly um, that David has to deal with his son, even to the point of war. And you know what's interesting? David still says, look at verse 5 in chapter 18. Look, we're already at chapter 18. The king commanded Joab, Abisha, and Ida, uh, be gentle with the young man, Absalom, for my sake. And all the troops heard the king, all the troops, everybody heard him say this. Be gentle with my boy. Be gentle with him. Concerning the Absalom to each of the commanders, they're like, just bring him back here. I don't want him dead. I don't, I don't want this war to go down like that. I just want you to be gentle with my son. Bring him back here so I can get this all figured out. David still loved this son. Still cared for him. But Absalom, look at this. I want you to, in case you've drifted off, Absalom still has no idea. He still has no idea that his dad loves him. That his dad cares for him. He thinks they're a war. He thinks that they're, they're battling. Absalom has no idea. Now, how many of you love a, a story with a happy ending? This isn't one of them. <laughs> Sorry. David's army is out looking for Absalom. They're trying to find him. And Absalom was out riding along on a, on a mule with his Brad Pitt like hair. Remember the picture from earlier? And as he's riding along, he goes under a tree, and, and that beautiful hair that he was blessed with, I wish I had that hair for anybody else, it gets hung up in the tree. Ladies, y'all can understand, right? He gets hung up in the tree, and he's stuck. He's stuck. And he gets stuck in the branches. <sighs> and wouldn't you know who, who comes along and finds him? Joab. Remember him? David's assistant? <laughs> he finds him tangled up in the tree and he's still ticked about his fields. Oh yeah, you remember when you burned up my fields and did all that stuff? And he ignores the king's request of being gentle and bringing home his son. And he stabs him three times. And then he gives the order for the men to finish him off. And Absalom dies he dies without knowing how his father really feels. And when David learns of Absalom's death, he goes into a private place. The Bible says that he was shaking and weeping. That he was shaking and weeping and crying hysterically to the point of losing his breath. Verse 33, the king was shaken and he went up to the room over the gateway and he wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. If only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Regret. A feeling of sorrow, of disappointment, of distress, and remorse. The desire the wish that one could change and do something differently. <laughs> the cognitive negative state or emotional state that involves blaming oneself for bad outcome, that paralyzes a person's ability to grow, move forward, and their well-being. This morning, some of us are drowning in the sea of regret. We're drowning. There's no other word to put it. 
there is so much that we would want to change. It happens real quick. When we begin to think about it, when we begin to write things down, that list of, if I had only done this, if I had only done that, if I had only said this, if I had only said that, if I had only not done this, or only not done that, oh, it would be different. If I could just have another shot. If this is you, I just want to tell you something. It is paralyzing your ability to move forward. All that stuff we talked about for eight weeks. Where, where Jesus spoke to his disciples in the upper room and, and looking at Joshua's life and how God gave him strength and courage. And purity. All of us, we know these things. We just went through it. But for some of us, we're not moving forward because of the worry we talked about last week. And for some of us, we're not moving forward because of the regret. Because of the pain, because of the remorse, because of the guilt, because of the shame, because of all these things. And if this is you, I've got a very simple passage today because I, I want to read over you because I want you to be rescued. Jesus wants you to be rescued. And he wants you to hear this. Because here's the thing. Jesus rescued all of us from this emotion of regret with one huge act. It's called the cross. He took care of it. It's kind of a big deal. That all of our bad decisions, dumb words, dumb mistakes, wrong turns, tricks, stumbles, and failures, the stuff that if people knew about us, we'd be so embarrassed and wouldn't want to show our face. He died for all that. He fixed it. He says, I separate your sin as far as the east is from the west. Throw it to the sea of forgetfulness. It doesn't even, it, it's inadmissible in court. It didn't never happen. It's been forgotten. You've been reconciled. The Bible says all things have become new. The old things have passed away. The past, let's go back to it, is not my house right with God now. Stop living in the things that you can't change. Stop living in the moments that you, that you can't fix. It's been done. Use it as your, test, as your testimony. Use the, the storm as your story. And lean on the cross. These flood waters of emotions, they will always rise. And if we're not careful, we will sink. But he rescued us. I'll, I'm going to read this passage and then we're, then we're done. I, I just want you to hear these words. It's, it's a lot. It's, second, it's Colossians, the second chapter. I'm going to read 6 through 14. And that's it. Just hear these words. Don't, don't zone out. This is God speaking over us. What we need to hear to be rescued. So then, just as you received Christ as your Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. Rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. In other words, this wasn't a procedure that went down. No, no, not, not like we would think. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through your faith and the workings of God, who raised him from the dead. Look at verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of your sins. But maybe this is all you need to hear. Having canceled the charge that stood against you. Took care of it. This charge that would have condemned us, that is still condemning some of us now. Because we haven't let this take place. He reminds us of how he did it. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. It's done. It's done. You've been reconciled. You, you, your, your past. 
your mistakes, your failures, all those things that imprison you, they've been paid for. Don't be paralyzed by what you can't change. Don't be paralyzed by what you have done. That's why he died on the cross. And what's beautiful is that someone was like, well, I made a mistake this morning. Okay, then bring it to the cross. He'll nail it there. And it goes away. His blood washes over that note you just put there. I, I wrote that down. I can't, I, I can't believe I did this. You put it on the cross, and then his blood it washes it away. It's gone. It's gone. See, this time can be rough reading this story and can kind of make us feel overwhelmed. But the reality is this, is this is actually a very good therapy session. It's a very good therapy session because what he's reminding us of is that this is a happy ending. That he loved us enough that he took care of it all for us. Let's bow our heads and let's see where God will lead us in this moment. Lord, I thank you today for the time that we've had to talk about regret. Lord, I know, no doubt, you have spoke to us in different ways. Lord, some of us, we needed to hear certain things. Others of us needed to hear other things. Lord, some of us needed to hear very simply that we've got to move on. We've got to move forward, but yet we can't move forward because we're living in the past. Because of the things that we would do differently, because of the things that we've done. Lord, we can't change them. Now, there is a lot at stake here. For some of us, Lord, it is paralyzing our ability to love others, to minister your grace, your wisdom, and your words to other people around us. People that matter to us. We have loved ones and friends and family. We have, Lord, we have children. We have spouses that we are ignoring. We have kids that we are avoiding. Lord, we have coworkers that, that we need to have these conversations with, but we have not. Lord, may we get over this emotion. May we embrace the things that have happened and realize that they were for a purpose and for a reason. And that what matters is if we are right with you now. Right now. It's not about three days ago. Three months ago or three years ago, it's about right now. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just speak to us. Lord, that you would just show us the things in our hearts and our minds right now. Lord, don't let us get distracted and think about things later that are happening today or tomorrow or, or the things that are happening maybe even in front of us or behind us or what everyone else is doing. No, 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 no. Don't let us do that. May we focus on you so that you can show us why you brought us here today. Lord, don't let one of us think you're the same way we all do. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your reconciliation. We thank you so much for the cross. pray these things in your name.